My name is Chelsea Luciani. I'm a senior manager in the Trade Policy and Negotiations branch, BC Ministry of Jobs, Economic Development and Competitiveness. We are co-hosting this webinar with the Investment Capital Branch from the same ministry on the invitation of the Kootenai Association for Science and Technology. In today's webinar, you will learn about how tax credit programs work and about opportunities for businesses in Canada's free trade agreements and how it may apply in your particular case. We are pleased to see so many of you joining with us today. Our presenters today are Matthew Brown, Director of Tax Credit Programs from the Investment Capital Branch, and Gana Drives, Manager, Trade Policy and Negotiations Branch. We are also joined by Regan Khan, a fellow Senior Manager from the Trade Policy and Negotiations Branch. So before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so that you know how to participate in today's event. The webinar will last for approximately an hour and 30 minutes. We will have two presentations, about 30 to 40 minutes each, and you will have the opportunity to submit questions to the presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. So you should see a box there where you can type in your questions, and at the end of it, I will read out the questions. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and as I said, I will collect these at the end for a Q&A session. During the webinar, we're going to have a couple of poll questions so that we can focus the content on what is most of interest to you. At the end of the presentation, um, you will also receive a recording of the presentation today in a follow-up email. And I just want to draw your attention to a couple of handouts that we've put in the presentation pane. So if you go down to where it says handouts and three, there are a couple of handouts there that you can download for your own background information and reference. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Matthew Brown, Director of Tax Credit Programs in the Investment Capital Branch. Matthew, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. And uh, thank you for, for inviting me to deliver the presentation on uh, the provinces. Uh, venture capital tax credit program, which is the means by which the province uh, stimulates investment in BC small businesses and specifically in the manufacturing and processing sectors. Right? And then, so thank you. So, whether we're one of us every day, you're a service from a company that started out as a business, and you recognize all of these logos on. Uber and Airbnb and the companies whose apps you download onto your smartphone and your iPad. And what all of these companies have so pervasive and large out as small venture capital backed companies. And in their early years, an investor or a group of investors uh, liked what the founders were doing in these companies and decided to back the company by taking an equity stake in the business. And so uh, taking an equity stake in a new startup business is venture capital investment. And that's the, 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 the topic that I'm speaking about today, the, the, the province's program of providing a tax credit to investors that will stimulate investment in new young startup businesses, uh, specifically in the technology sectors. Now, some of you may be familiar with venture capital and others maybe not so much. So I'll just talk a little bit about venture capital and, and its characteristics. Jesse, can you go to the next slide? Well, I suppose that the, the uh, bonds being safer options and venture capital is at the risky end of the spectrum. It's, it's characterized by being volatile and high risk. And the, the characteristics that make venture capital high risk is that it is investment in new companies. Very often they have no tangible assets, they have no revenue, and they, are, they have no products. They're, they're developing new, innovative, untried and untested technologies that hopefully for the company in a few years time they can commercialize that technology so they're 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 high risk propositions they're at the risky end of that investment spectrum and so for an investor what the attractiveness of venture capital companies are is that along with high risk comes the opportunity for high return and investors in venture capital companies are not looking for stock price appreciation that you might get if you're looking for investing in, say, a mutual fund or stocks on the Toronto Stock Exchange. 
a venture capital investor is looking for explosive growth with the company having something called an exit event, which is either a merger and acquisition or an initial public offering. And so typically what a venture investor is looking for is something like 10 times return on investment at a minimum, uh, but, but probably more so looking for 30 to 50 times uh, the return on their initial investment. Failure rate with venture capital backed companies. That many are developing a technology which is untried. Uh, it has yet to be commercialized. And so there's a high failure rate. And so if an investor is investing in a spread of venture capital companies, they would be looking for a high return from the one company that develops that breakout technology that will cover the investment costs of investing in, say, the, the seven or eight other venture capital companies. Next slide, please, Chelsea. But the, uh, the graph we have in front of us now is a, a, a typical uh, growth graph for a venture-backed company. Uh, some companies may have a growth phase of say two to three years, particularly those companies that are developing apps. Uh, th this graph is a five year time frame, which would be typical five to seven years for a company developing information technology and 10 say developing a medical device or developing uh, some uh, pharmacology or, or a drug. And so what you see is the and the green wavy line are the net earnings. And so in the very early years of the company, it's burning through cash. It has raised investment from uh, investors in its early stage, and it's burning through that cash. And if it survives after two or three years, it may break through that break even point and having commercialized its product or its technology may start earning some revenue. The very first investors would be the, the founder owners and uh, family members as well, uh, followed by angel investors. So typically these would be high net worth individuals. They may have been successful executives in other venture backed companies. So they've been through the process and know how to grow a company from being a small company to get to that stage where they have a, an exit event, uh, an initial public offering or a merger and acquisition. And, and so what these people do, they're, they're critical to developing venture companies because not only do they bring uh, money and invest in the company, but they bring their experience and their expertise and their contacts as well. And so they are active in mentoring these companies. So in the initial years, they, there would be the investment from the founders, founder owners and their family, then followed by angel investors, and then followed by institutional investors. The province's tax credit program is aimed at the very early stage. We are aimed at providing a tax credit to help offset the risk of investing in what would, is otherwise a very risky proposition. So the tax credit program is aimed at the seed stage and the early investment stage. Next, please. And so the means by which the province stimulates investment in these risky businesses is providing a 30% tax credit to the investors. And the, the investment, the tax credit doesn't go to the business, it goes to the investors who are risking the, the, their own money to purchase an equity stake in the business. And, and it's, purpose is to offset not all of the risk, but some of the risk of making that investment. Not every company is eligible to receive, uh, to be registered in the program and to uh, raise tax credit supported money. And so there are a couple of uh, criteria really, and I'll get into more detail and talk about the specific criteria in the next few, few slides. But for a business to be able to raise tax credit supported money, it has to be, first of all, registered in the program and it has to meet registration criteria and submit an application to us to 
uh, to be considered for registration, we have to then do something called uh, issue an equity authorization. So this is the right for the business to then go out and raise equity investment. And we do this every year. So every business that is registered in the program and wants to raise money in the next uh, 12 months has to apply and we would issue an equity authorization if it was in compliance with the, the program's requirements. So it's the right for the company to go out and raise investment from investors. And it can be any amount of money. It could be, say, $10,000, or it could be uh, several million dollars, five million, seven million. It really, it depends on, first of all, two things, how much of the tax credit budget the program has left when the company applies for the equity authorization and what they plan to do. If the company has got a plan for the next year to raise cash and invest it, say in purchasing plant and equipment, and the amount of plant and equipment is a million dollars, then it's reasonable that we would give uh, an equity authorization around a million dollars. And the, the final thing that the business must do is issue shares for cash. So the program is based on issuing equity shares or preferred shares or, or something called a convertible right, which is a, basically it's a contract for the company to receive cash from an investor uh, for which the investor will be issued shares at some time in the future. And so the, the, this concept of issuing equity shares for cash is important because uh, a loan converted into cash or sweat equity would not qualify for the tax credit. It has to be shares issued from treasury for uh, cash that is invested in the business. Next slide, please. So I'll talk a little bit about how to actually claim the tax credits. Uh, this is sometimes overlooked when people discuss programs and how, how does it actually work? Well, the way it works is that if there is a registered company in the program and it goes out and raises investment, it claims the tax credit on behalf of the investors. We have a, a online system that is triple password protected and the company, once it has raised investment, it will go to the website and it will input the details of the investment to claim the tax credit. And so it would be things like the investor's name, the amount of the investment, the number of shares purchased, the date of the investment, and, and so on. We have to do some due diligence and, and it might not, not just be for one investor, it could be for a dozen investors, it could be 50 or so investors. So the company after investment would go to the website, enter the details and claim the tax credit on behalf of the investors. Once that has happened, we have to do some due diligence on our end to make sure that the company and the investors are in compliance. For instance, if there's an investor that is resident outside of British Columbia and uh, they are not filing a BC income tax return, for instance, they would not qualify for the tax credit. So we have to do some due diligence on our end. Uh, the end result, though, is that we release a, a tax credit certificate, and it's a PDF document that gets loaded to our website. Registrant company gets a system-generated email telling it to go to the website and retrieve the tax credit certificates. So it's a, it's a physical document, it's a PDF document containing the tax credit information, who the investor invested in, the amount of the investment, and the amount of the tax credit. And the way that the investor claims the tax credit is that once the company has distributed the certificate to the investor, the investor will claim the tax credit when they file their tax return. So we have uh, just finished the bulk of our work in processing a couple of thousand tax credit certificates for investors for the for the. Uh, 29 calendar year and investors have been filing their tax returns with the CRA and including the details of the tax credit uh, certificate information in their tax returns. 
And for the individual investor, if they have no BC income taxes owing, the CRA will cut a refund check for 30% of the amount of the investment. Next slide, please. There are some features of the, uh, the, the tax credit. Uh, first of all, the registrants, the companies themselves, they, they have to be corporations. And uh, so if a company has an abbreviation incorporated limited corp after its name then uh, it can be registered in the tax credit program cooperative associations are also incorporated entities so they can also be registered in the pro so for the features of the of the tax credit itself an individual and a corporate investor uh, if they are filing a BC income tax return, uh, are eligible for the tax credit. So if they've made the investment and they are filing a BC income tax return in the year in which they make the investment, they would be eligible for the tax credit. For the individual investor, that investor is entitled to a credit up to $120,000, which means that they can make an investment up to $400,000, which with a 30% tax credit, they can get a 120,000 credit. And for corporations, they are treated differently. Uh, the amount of investment that a corporation can, a corporate investor can make is unlimited. And, but with a corporation, they have to have taxes owing. So they, they will get a non-refundable tax credit. Uh, they can make an unlimited amount of investment and can receive an unlimited amount of tax credit, but they will be they will get a non-refundable tax credit. So they have to have BC income taxes owing against which to offset the credit. Another feature of the credit is that there's a four-year carry forward. So an investor can make an investment in year one, and if they don't use all that portion of the tax credit when they file their tax return, they can carry forward unused portions of the credit for the next four years. We've just finished the 29 uh, tax credit season. And so if an investor made an investment in 2019 and didn't use all of their credit up in 2019, they could carry forward unused portions of the credit in each year from 2019 through to 2023 which is five years. So it's the year of investment plus a four year carry forward. Next slide. There are eligibility criteria that I mentioned previously that uh, not every business is eligible for registration in the program. Registrants have to meet eligibility criteria. They have to be incorporated entities registered to operate in BC. That means registered with the uh, the BC Registrar of Companies. The business must have no more than 100 employees at the time of registration. It must have a permanent place of business in BC. It must pay 75% of wages and salaries to employees who report to work in BC. It must have 80% of its assets in BC, and it must have raised already a minimum of $25,000 of equity capital before it comes to the program for registration. And this amount of money is not eligible for the tax credit. So what we want to see is that the owners have invested or found an investor who is invested and made a stake in the business before it comes to the program. And the final criteria is the business must be substantially engaged in, in one or more of uh, an eligible business activity which are on the next slide. There are eight business activities. So these are the business activities that a, a business uh, that wants to be registered in the program must be involved in. It, it can be one of these or several of them. So the first one is manufacturing and processing. And that would be defined as a company that takes input raw materials and turns the raw materials into a finished product. So manufacturing and processing. And we include things like wineries and breweries in that category. So we have, there's been a, a quite a, 
a number of wineries and breweries in the past few years because of the popularity of craft brewing, for instance. So we have quite a number of registrants that are wineries and breweries, and, and they fit under the manufacturing and processing category. Then this research and development of proprietary technology. This could be for the life sciences companies or companies developing information technology. Uh, they has to have some ownership right of the technology and to be able to exploit the technology and commercialize it. A company that is doing R&D on a contract basis wouldn't qualify. The company actually has to be doing R&D and be able to exploit the technology uh, once it's developed. The third category is destination tourism. So this would include something like a tourist ski lodge or a fishing lodge, something like that would fit under the, the tourism category. We do have a definition of, of tourism. Uh, it is a business where more than 50% of the revenue comes from tourists and a tourist would be someone who resides more than 40 kilometers away from the business. The fourth category is interactive digital media. So this one would be for companies that would be developing uh, games, for instance. It was, it was created back in 2000. Uh, Vancouver's uh, burgeoning gaming community was, uh, was happening. So interactive digital media for games, but also uh, there are many life sciences companies that are now developing interactive digital products as well. So gaming, life sciences would fit under that category. We have a clean technology category. This is, would be companies doing R&D in clean technology or manufacturing and processing of a clean technology product. The next one is something called advanced commercialization. This is companies that are using all the products or the services of other companies. This category is only available for companies that are located outside of Metro Vancouver or the uh, Capital Regional District. So if you, uh, I'll give you an example. So if you go online and you're shopping for something online and you go away and then when you go back to your computer, you see some ads for something similar to what you were looking for. So there's a, there's a, a, a product shopping habits and it's then, pitched an ad at you based on what you've been viewing and what you've been buy buying. So that would be an example uh, of advanced commercialization. The next one is community diversification. Again, this one is for companies outside of Metro Vancouver and outside of the Victoria area. And it's for companies that are uh, involved in a business that is diversifying the local uh, economy and so it could be any of the above also include uh, service businesses as well and then finally scale up scale up is for uh, companies that have been in the program for two years they've already raised money in the program and they've developed a a product and they're now ready to commercialize it and they need to raise funds for their marketing activities and so those are the, the eight categories that a business must be in. And the way that we assess whether a business is in one of these categories is that in our regulation, there is a formula and the business must have more than 50% of its assets plus its expenses engaged in one or more of these qualifying activities. Next slide, please. Just as there are some uh, approved uh, qualifying activities, there are some prohibited activities. So in our regulation, there are a number of uh, activities that are prohibited and they include financial services. So anything such as banking or lending or investment services, trading securities uh, are in the financial services category and would be prohibited. Retail stores, <clears throat> gift stores are also prohibited. Real estate development, resource extraction is another prohibited activity. So businesses that are involved in exploration and extraction in, for example, oil and gas or mining or forestry uh, are prohibited and, and food and beverage services are also a prohibited activity. 
Next slide, please. There are two ways uh, for an investor to make an investment in a venture capital company. And uh, these, are, these are the two methods. There are uh, numerous acronyms in our legislation. One is called the Eligible Business Corporation and the other is called the Venture Capital Corporation. The Eligible Business Corporation is the direct investment model where the business sells shares directly to investors. The Venture Capital Corporation model is the, the pooled funds method where a group of investors can get together pool their funds, form a corporation called a venture capital corporation, and then they can go out and seek other investors and the venture capital corporation will invest the proceeds in one or many small businesses. And those small businesses also have to meet the qualifying criteria that I've gone through in the previous couple of slides. So the same qualifying activities and the same registration requirements apply to companies that venture capital corporations would invest in. Next. This is the direct investment model. So this is the example of a, an investor purchasing shares directly from a registrant. In this case, it's the eligible business corporation. And so the investor purchases the shares. The company claims the tax credit on behalf of the investor. There is a requirement that the investor hold their shares for a five-year period. There's this concept in venture capital of patient capital. It takes time for a business to develop its technology and bring its technology or its product to, to market. And so there is a requirement that the investor has to hold their, their shares for a five-year period. If they dispose of the shares within five years, then the investor is at risk of having to repay back all or a portion of the tax credit. Another feature of eligible business corporations is that they can raise up to $10 million under the program. They can raise any amount of money outside of the program, but within the tax credit program, businesses are capped at 10 million. Next. This is the example of the capital corporation. And this is the pooled investment model where uh, investors would purchase shares from a venture capital corporation. The VCC itself would then take the proceeds and invest in one or many small businesses. And so it's, it's a way of uh, spreading the risk by making investments in more than one small business. Unlike an investor, in an eligible business corporation that must hold their shares for five years, there's no such requirement for a VCC investor. They can dispose of their shares as soon as they've made the investment, in fact. However, the VCC has to hold the investment for five years. So the VCC, the onus is on the VCC making an investment in a small business and holding that investment for the five year period. And as with eligible business corporations that can raise up to 10 million, a VCC can invest up to 10 million in a single small business. Next. We have some ongoing compliance uh, requirements as well. So not only do we, we register the businesses and issue equity authorizations, allowing the business to go out and raise investment and process tax credit certificates, but there's also a requirement that we attempt to ensure that the province is getting value for money for the tax credits that have been issued to the investors. And so there's a, there's a compliance uh, part of our branch that, that uh, looks at the businesses to ensure that the business is in the qualifying activity for the five year period and that investors hold, continue to hold their shares for the five year period. And if a business wants to leave the program in under five years or an investor wants to dispose of the shares within the five year period, we manage that process. And so we can, if a company uh, does have an, uh, its exit event, a merger and acquisition or an IPO, we can uh, tell it what its liability is. Uh, so if a company is approached and it's going to be acquired, 
we can tell the company what its tax credit liability is and they can uh, include that amount in their negotiations around the price per share because that will then tell the investors if they are disposing of their shares how much they have to repay back to the province. The, the main route by which we ensure compliance is through an annual return. So each business that is registered in our program has to submit a return to us for uh, the five year period and the return would be a copy of the financial statements and a copy of the securities register that we can uh, look at to ensure that investors continue to hold their shares for the five year period. And uh, just by uh, before I get to the final slide, uh, just uh, a couple of stats on the program for the 2019 period. Well, let's go to 2018 first. So in 2018, we had about 215 businesses raised about $106 million worth of equity in the program. For 2019, it was a little better and 230 businesses raised over $150 million worth of equity in the program, uh, which is about $35 million of tax credits that we issued. And as far as the number of individual tax credits, it's something like 2,500 uh, individual tax credit certificates uh, being processed that, that go to investors and who have, uh, uh, in, in the previous months, uh, attached to their tax returns and filed their tax returns with the CRA and maybe some of them are, are still in the process of filing their their tax returns and and filing their tax credit certificates so the, the final slide is is what are we doing now and uh, what we have ongoing at the moment is we know that our program is well known and it's well understood in the lower mainland and to a lesser extent in the capital region uh, where there are uh, significant tech clusters, also around the Kelowna area, uh, where there's also a, a tech cluster. But we're, we're not well known, we don't think, in other areas of the province. So we've started this outreach exercise that got underway before COVID-19 started. And it involved us going out uh, to the regions, to uh, the smaller towns, and uh, talking about the program and seeing if there were companies, maybe manufacturing and processing companies, companies doing R&D or clean tech or new media that might benefit for being registered in the program and, and uh, might be contemplating raising equity investment over the, the next couple of years. So, uh, so we started this outreach exercise and this webinar is part, part of the outreach exercise to try and uh, talk about the program and explain the program, answer questions, and to identify if there are, are companies that are interested in being registered in the program. Of course, with COVID-19 now, our travel restrictions are on, on hold, and so we're now uh, just uh, doing the, the webinar component of the outreach, but when travel restrictions are lifted, we, we hope to be hitting the road and be uh, be visiting towns, cities around the province uh, and, and meeting with potential registrants and investors to see if there's any interest in the tax credit program. And the final slide is uh, contact information. And so if uh, any members in the, the audience uh, know of a business or have a business that might be interested in knowing more about the program, uh, here is the program's contact information. We have a toll-free number. We have a generic email address where uh, people can send questions. And we have a portfolio manager who is on duty each week uh, answering questions and uh, speaking to potential registrants and potential investors about the program. And so anyone is welcome to uh, pick up the phone or send an email uh, with a question uh, about how the program operates and how a company can get registered in the tax credit program. Back to you, Chelsea. Great, thank you so much, Matthew. So as I said earlier, we're gonna hold the questions until the end of the session. So I'm just gonna pass it over to Ghana now to talk about free trade agreements. Okay, thank you, Chelsea. 
Uh, so the branch I work in uh, represents BC interests in free trade agreement negotiations, in trade disputes and affecting BC. And we also work close um, and we also work to increase the business's awareness of the opportunities in free trade agreements. So the things I plan to discuss today will be of interest to you if you are currently exporting or interested in exporting goods and services to other Canadian product, uh, provinces or to other countries, but it also applies to you if you import goods and services. Uh, I know we have a diverse audience today from uh, skincare and tea producers to consultants and uh, high-tech companies, and uh, we'll aim to, to make it relevant to all of you. So before I move to the presentation itself, I'd like to say that uh, we recognize uh, the current global challenges in the international uh, trade and supply chain that uh, you currently experience. And I'm not here to suggest that uh, leveraging the opportunities in free trade agreements is as simple um, and will help you to overcome these challenges. But uh, the free trade agreements might help you to diversify your current markets and your current suppliers. So next slide, please. Uh, so today uh, I will go over a little about our ministry, what free trade agreements do, Canada's domestic and international free trade agreements. Uh, I will also cover the opportunities that free trade agreements present for BC businesses and communities. And I will also show you some useful tools and resources at the end. So some of this content will be technical and uh, a bit dense. But the good thing is that uh, we will have time for questions later on. And uh, uh, if you only take one thing away today, I hope that it will be that, uh, uh, you know, if you have questions or concerns, you can contact me, uh, my branch or any of the offices and resources that I will, show, uh, I will share at the end of the presentation. And if we can't help you, we'll know who to put you in touch with for further assistance. Uh, so, uh, the uh, Ministry of Jobs, uh, Economic Development and Competitiveness aims to make life more affordable for British Columbians by uh, building a strong, sustainable and innovative economy that works for everyone. There are many ways to foster the economic growth and free trade agreements, leveraging the opportunities that they offer is one of them. So through uh, free trade agreements, BC goods and services can become more competitive and uh, we can also revitalize traditional industries and establish new ones. We can also foster trade diversification and create new jobs. We understand that free trade agreements can be long, complex and technical, and we are here to help you to navigate their web. So in the past year, as Matthew's team, uh, we've been traveling and delivering seminars throughout BC. Uh, this year, we are mostly doing remote info sessions, but uh, we continue to make sure that uh, the economic benefits of free trade agreements are widespread, well understood and leveraged uh, by BC companies. So uh, first off, uh, moving to the next slide, uh, let's talk about free trade agreements and what they do. So free trade agreements or FTAs in simple terms uh, is an agreement between uh, two or more countries to facilitate trade and eliminate trade barriers. Trade barriers can be tariff barriers like duties paid on the product and non-tariff barriers. For example, standard that has been um, put in place that is not based on science and is meant to keep exports out. The free trade agreements, they create more predictable and transparent conditions for businesses that operate in foreign countries. Uh, of course, free trade agreements provide BC and Canadian businesses with preferential access to a wider range of export and international investment opportunities, both in established but also in emerging markets. As such, it is important to know how these agreements are structured and function in each market in order to determine how your company, uh, company's goods and services can benefit from them. You do not need to go into every detail of an FTA and uh, there are also no identical FTAs. However, there are uh, typical areas that they cover, such as goods, 
and one of the most tangible things that FTA uh, does is tariff reduction or tariff elimination on goods uh, services as well. Uh, FTA set out the rules regarding the treatment of foreign service suppliers. Another common area is investment, uh, which protects investors from discriminatory uh, or uh, arbitrary treatment in their host country. And uh, also FTAs cover government procurement uh, by providing greater access to FTAs partners, government uh, procuring services. So the scope of, of FTAs is of course larger than that. It covers also labor, um, environment, electronic commerce, dispute settlement and other areas, but goods, services, investment and government procurement they form the backbone of a trade agreement. I will go uh, through all these four areas in more detail later on in my presentation. Um, so moving to the next slide, uh, you uh, might have noticed uh, that in the current uh, trade of state of trade, there is an increased protectionism and uh, trade tensions that uh, might create sometimes uncertainty in trade. Uh, the good news is that Canada has been busy with the securing preferential access uh, for Canadian goods and services throughout a network of free trade agreements. And this map shows you uh, where in the world Canada free trade agreements have been implemented, like light blue, for example, the United States, the European Union, uh, Australia, uh, where the uh, free trade agreements, um, oh, sorry, where uh, the free trade negotiations were concluded, like dark blue, uh, such as Malaysia, uh, or where the exploratory discussions and negotiations uh, on the potential uh, free trade agreements are still ongoing. Uh, these are marked in green, and uh, these are China, India, Turkey, Brazil, and, and many others. So Canada is the only uh, G7 country with the preferential FTA access to the world's two largest economies, the European Union and the United States. And in fact, we are the only country with preferential access to all G7 countries. So I will pause here uh, and I will launch our first polling question. Uh, so the uh, question that you are going to see on the screen now uh, reads, uh, which of these countries does Canada not have a separate free trade agreement with? And the options are the UK, South Korea, Ukraine, and Honduras. So you have a couple of uh, moments to select the appropriate response and then to click Submit. Oh, it looks like now oh, we have 30, 40% that have voted. Please uh, go on and uh, submit the responses and I will close the poll in a few moments. Okay, uh, so we are now closing the poll. Uh, those of you who, have, who um, have not responded, you have an opportunity to um, to see the answers. So, um, as you can see, it looks like the majority has. Oh, actually, there, there is no majority. Both thirty-three percent have responded that uh, Ukraine and Honduras uh, do, do not have a separate free trade agreement with uh, Canada. And then 22% of you have responded that it is actually the UK, which is the right answer. Um, the uh, United Kingdom does not have a separate free trade agreement with uh, Canada yet. The UK uh, left the European Union on January 31st this year, uh, and it is now in the transition period uh, until at least December 31st, 2020. But Canada has agreed to the terms of the uh, Canada EU trade agreement. So, CETA, Canada European Union uh, Economic Trade Agreement, still uh, works, still applies 
uh, to the United Kingdom during their transition period from the European Union. And uh, if no trade agreement is ne negotiated between Canada and the U UK during the transition period, um, uh, the UK uh, will be the trade with the UK will be uh, on uh, the UK global tariff and uh, WTO terms, which are quite a bit less preferential uh, than the terms under uh, the Canada EU um, trade agreement. And uh, um, Canada has a separate free trade agreement with Honduras since 2014 with the South Korea since uh, 2015 and with Ukraine since 2017. Um, so now let's get back to the presentation. I think we might be having some Difficulties with the change in the slides. Uh, okay, I will. Um, I will move on. Um, to the next slide, and hopefully Chelsea can. Um, Try and move on with the with the poll. Uh, so whether uh, it is NAFTA uh, or KUSMA, the uh, free trade agreement with uh, Europe or South Korea, uh, we now have um, uh, 14 free trade agreements that cover uh, 51 countries. Um, and um, you can see that uh, uh, Canada is a party uh, to bilateral. Um, free trade agreements, but it also uh, party to multilateral free trade agreements. And sometimes free trade agreements, they overlap. For example, Canada is in free trade agreement with uh, Mexico uh, through uh, NAFTA, uh, soon to be replaced by KUSMA, and also through CPTPP, which is the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. The good news is that uh, free trade agreements do not cancel each other. Um, and uh, you can choose under which free trade agreement you want to claim preferential terms of trade. Um, Canada also has two uh, domestic free trade agreements, and uh, which are the Canadian Free Trade Agreement and New West Partnership Trade Agreement. So before I continue, uh, let's stop here for the uh, second polling question. Um, it will make the remainder of the presentation uh, even more relevant to you. So hopefully it works. I'm launching the uh, second poll, uh, polling question. And the qu question is, in trade with what countries and regions are you uh, most interested in? And you have multiple choice answers, Canadian provinces, US and Mexico, Europe and Asia Pacific. So it looks like 50% of you have responded. I'll wait for a couple of more moments before closing the poll. So please go on and uh, submit your responses. OK, I think that that's it. And I'll be closing the poll and sharing the results with you. Uh, so 44% are more interested in trade with the Asia Pacific countries. Um, and then it is split between Canadian provinces and territories and uh, US and Mexico, 22% each, uh, and a, a little bit less of interest for the European Union, uh, 11%. Uh, so uh, let's move on uh, to the... Um, uh, the, the good question, uh, the, the good thing is that uh, uh, I will cover all of these um, areas, all of these regions in uh, today's presentation. Uh, so let's move on to the um, 
next slide. And uh, before uh, we start with the uh, international free trade agreements, I wanted to briefly stop um, on two Canadian domestic ones. So I hope that you can uh, see the slides on the screen now. Uh, so the uh, Canadian Free Trade Agreements, uh, which uh, is abbreviated to CFTA, uh, replaced the Agreement on Internal Trade uh, on in uh, 2017, and uh, it includes all provinces, territories, and federal government. Uh, the CFTA covers most of the service economy, which accounts for 70% of uh, Canada's GDP. Uh, the Canadian Free Trade Agreement uh, enhances the flow of goods and services, investment and uh, labor mobility. It eliminates technical barriers to trade and uh, greatly expands uh, procurement coverage and also promotes regulatory cooperation with Canada. So often, as you know, regulatory differences between provinces can make it more difficult and costly for companies to trade, to invest and open businesses in more than one province uh, or territory. And under the CFTA, the C government is currently negotiating several mutual recognition agreements, uh, for example, the construction codes, uh, in order to streamline and to reduce barriers uh, to trade between, uh, between the provinces. Another uh, free trade agreement, uh, the domestic one, is New West Partnership Trade Agreement. Um, and uh, this is the agreement between BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Uh, this agreement uh, builds upon the Trade Investment uh, Labor Mobility Agreement, uh, which is called TILMA. Um, and initially, it was between BC and Alberta. Uh, Saskatchewan was the first to join, and then recently Manitoba did. And also, uh, Ontario expressed interest to join. Uh, New West Partnership Trade Agreement. Uh, has been fully implemented in 2013, and it became the largest interprovincial free trade zone. Uh, so among other things, it offers streamlined business registration. Um, oh, here we go. The slides are back. Uh, it offers the streamlined uh, business registration, and uh, you can register in one province and uh, uh, tick boxes for the for the other provinces in this agreement. Um, and you are ready to go. Uh, so the good thing, if you, if we have some uh, issues or difficulties with the slides, uh, you will have the uh, presentations afterwards and um, recording of the webinar. There are some delay. There is some delay with the slides. So moving on, U.S.-Mexico uh, agreement known as and uh, the U so CUSMA is expected to enter into force on uh, July first this year and it will replace NAFTA on its entry into force. Um, the uh, KUSMA largely expands and modernizes the NAFTA while protecting key elements of the NAFTA that are important to BC. And it also expected to provide certain uh, three. And uh, um, so on a side note, uh, no free trade agreement will provide complete protection from unfair US measures, no guarantee complete certainty or predictability. But I also wanted to highlight uh, that the current border closure between Canada and the U.S. is not impacting the essential travel and trade and commerce and uh, trucking, trade, uh, train and uh, air freight uh, services. They continue between Canada and U.S. without interruption. So moving to the next slide, uh, as I mentioned, Kuzma largely extends and modernizes the original NAFTA. And in this table, uh, you can see what key provisions were preserved and um, where the modernizations and changes happened. So maintained uh, key areas um, include, but of course, this is not a, an extensive list, NAFTA's elimination of virtually all tariffs, uh, services access is also maintained. Uh, dispute settlement mechanism, temporary entry, uh, access to government procurement through uh, GPA. Um, Canada's supply management has also been preserved. So some other modernizations concern environment and labor chapters, as well as the digital trade. Uh, other key changes include 
stricter rules of origin on auto and parts, uh, incremental market access to dairy, poultry, and egg market, also phasing out investor state dispute settlement between Canada and the US. Um, another important change was handcrafted indigenous textile and uh, apparel goods for the first time in Canada's FTAs are now eligible, will be eligible for duty-free treatment if they meet um, the requirements. So uh, moving to the uh, next slide, and I'll probably uh, will not uh, spend as much time on this one as the, there is less interest, uh, but uh, Canada European Union Comprehensive Economic and uh, Trade Agreement known as CETA um, is actually an important one uh, since the European Union is the world's largest single market and uh, largest integrated economy. Uh, it is the market of approximately uh, 500 million consumers uh, and uh, it accounts for over uh, $18 trillion uh, in GDP. And to put this into perspective, the European Union is almost the same size of the economy as the United States in terms of the GDP, but it is more than 25% bigger in terms of population. So think about that. CETA has been provisionally in force as of uh, September 2017. It is in force provisionally because, of today, because as of today, only uh, 14 uh, out of 28 uh, European Union member states have ratified it. Here, you should not be confused by the word provisionally. In fact, most of the agreement, namely provisions dealing with the goods and services, and this is about 95%, uh, the agreement, uh, they were and are in full effect. So the customs duties, they were lowered right away because customs is the responsibility at the European Union level and not at the member level states. Uh, only a couple of areas will be implemented once the agreement is fully ratified and those are the dispute settlement mechanism and then the market access for portfolio investments. So with the CETA, Canada is now the only G7 country with preferential access to the world's two largest economies, as I've already mentioned, the US and uh, the European Union. And uh, we actually have an, a competitive advantage uh, over the US um, exporters to the European Union market since the United States, they do not have a deal with the European Union. Uh, so BC, uh, BC Goods and uh, Exports, uh, to the European Union have grown from 1.6 billion in 2014 to 2.1 billion Canadian dollars in 2019, making this B European Union as fifth BC's uh, largest trade partner. And uh, while it is difficult to determine the precise impact of this FTA on trade levels, the trade, uh, the trend uh, in the EU bound exports from BC is definitely a positive one. So moving to the uh, comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is uh, CPTPP, uh, this is Canada's most recently implemented free trade agreement. Uh, it is free uh, trade agreement between Canada and 10 other countries in the Asia-Pacific region and currently in force for seven countries in, that you can see in bold on this slide, Canada, Australia, Japan, Mexico, New Zealand, Singapore, and Vietnam. Uh, you may recall that it, it was originally uh, called the Trans-Pacific Partnership and that the US was part of that agreement before withdrawing under President Trump. So once the US withdrew, uh, the remaining countries uh, made some changes and salvaged the agreement and renamed it to the CPTPP. So in those markets, BC uh, actually has a competitive advantage uh, right now as well, uh, because US, they do not have an FTA with the, with the countries like Japan, for example. However, we know that this window will not last forever. And uh, US and Japan have reached a first stage trade agreement. It's not a full trade agreement yet, but uh, it will focus largely on agriculture and digital trade. And it might also give the US companies um, similar to same tariff preferences as BC and Canadian companies enjoy now. So once fully implemented, uh, the CPTPP uh, will uh, 
provide a preferential access and since other uh, other countries in the region have expressed interest in joining. And to the next slide, uh, let's turn to Canada's Korea uh, Free Trade Agreement, um, abbreviated to CKFTA, uh, which entered into force in 2015 and was Canada's first free trade agreement in the Asia Pacific. So this was an important deal for putting uh, you and other Canadian businesses on a level playing field with many of your international companies. Before the trade uh, deal, BC and Canadian companies were at a disadvantage because the European Union and the US had deals. Uh, so with a population of 50 million and a GDP of uh, 1.5 trillion USD dollars, uh, South Korea is a large market with uh, ample opportunities actually and uh, uh, it also has a growing middle class and uh, BC and Canadian goods and services are in a good reputation uh, there. And uh, South Korea is also a great uh, gateway to emerging and uh, fast growing markets in Asia. And it also has a strong, strong cultural and uh, business ties with Canada. So studies have also shown that uh, uh, Canada free trade agreement, uh, that uh, Korea, uh, Canada Korea free trade agreement might increase uh, goods exports from BC uh, and Canada to uh, South Korea by 32%. And Canada and BC have uh, already experienced uh, a notable export growth uh, in uh, several key sectors, such as coal, uh, ores, wood pulp, and some food preparations. So um, what all these free trade agreements have to offer you? And moving to the next slide, uh, we can see that uh, entering a free trade agreement, uh, entering the market uh, that uh, has a free trade agreement with FTA, it ensures actually greater certainty, stability, and transparency for quasi all areas of businesses. And it is important to consider whether and how these opportunities apply to you. So now let's have a look at the opportunities for goods. And the main opportunity for goods sectors in trade agreements is, of course, tariff reduction and elimination. For example, before the CPTPP, uh, before it entered into force for Canada and Vietnam, uh, BC blueberries going from uh, BC to, to Vietnam uh, had to pay a duty of 15%. And now with the CPTPP, the duty is zero. So countries without an FTA with Vietnam, they are still paying 15%. This makes BC blueberries a lot more competitive in Vietnam. Uh, however, some products may be free of tariffs, but others may not be. And uh, the tariffs may also be eliminated over a period of time. Um, and knowing what the tariffs that apply to your product in your specific market is, is essential. So there are also non-tariff barriers, reduction and elimination that is provided by free trade agreements. and. Uh, um, for example, uh, the duplicate testing or some similar procedures that need just to be done in one country. Uh, improved rules of origin. Uh, this is the recognition that in today's world, most things are not made using product coming from just one country. And rules of origin help to determine uh, where the good is originating, where it is produced, actually. And rules of origin allow uh, a product to be um, if considered from one country if it meets a certain percentage of domestic content. So if this is met, then you can claim the tariff preference as a Canadian good. And rules of origin, they differ from one agreement to another. So it is important to know how they apply to your specific product in a specific market. And we say that preferential treatment has to be claimed because the customs official, they will not assume that you get the preferential uh, tariff treatment if you are unsure about whether your product qualifies for preferential treatment. Um, but you can seek the advanced ruling uh, from the customs officials in the market that you want to export your product to. And whether it is a tariff a classification, a classification or origin, an advanced ruling is a binding ruling provided by uh, the customs administration and uh, they help to expedite the uh, 
customs clearance and provide greater certainty and stability uh, and predictability regarding the treatment of a product. And uh, finally, also a quick note on uh, exceptions and countries do maintain some exceptions in trade agreements. So it is important to check uh, to see if your goods fall uh, under one of the exceptions. For example, an exception for Canada uh, is the supply management. So moving to the next slide, uh, if you have a quick look at this table, uh, you will see uh, the overall tariff elimination for four uh, trade agreements. First is the KUSMA, um, then Canada Korea Free Trade Agreement, uh, Free Trade Agreement with the European Union, uh, and then the CPTPP. We've also put out, uh, put out some information to show you uh, the tariff elimination for specific sectors. So for KUSMA, the elimination of almost all tariff on Canadian goods is maintained. For uh, Canada Korea uh, free trade agreement, tariffs on 95% of Canadian goods are now reduced to zero. Uh, for CETA, uh, it's now 98% of tariffs are reduced and uh, it will be 99% over time. For CPTPP, uh, when uh, it will be fully implemented, 99% of tariff lines will be uh, duty free. So now I wanted to show you one uh, tool uh, called uh, Tariff Finder. Uh, so the Canada Tariff Finder is a user-friendly tool for figuring out uh, what sort of tariff uh, to your product. You can search a code if you know it or through a keyword search. So I know there is a local So on this page to your product. And uh, yeah, if we are moving a bit lower, so you can see uh, that the current uh, tariff under most favored uh, nation is uh, 90.6 uh, euro per hectoliter. Uh, that it means that this tariff applies to the cider that enters from a country uh, that Austria has no preferential trade agreement with. However, in our case, Canada has preferential tariff with Austria through, um, you can see, since 2017, the tariff has been reduced to zero. So the tariff finder allows you to check the tariffs in other markets and uh, or import. And uh, so now let's move to the OpenBC now has a uh, predictable market access for suppliers uh, of the FTA country. Access commands on the number of uh, and of a local presence uh, in the market uh, as a condition for doing business. Also, uh, KUSMA, uh, CKFTA, CETA, and the CPTPP all use what is called a negative list approach. Uh, that means that by an exception, but also temporary entry. And it allows certain categories of providers and investors to enter into the FTA market temporarily. This may be to work for a set duration or to see their investment firsthand or to get the, uh, the feel for the local business environment and uh, and the uh, du duration that is covered is the visa. So countries may want to protect their more uh, sensitive sectors as healthcare or education services. Um, so moving to the uh, next slide, and I think we have a couple of slides that are left. Uh, so uh, the opportunities uh, for um, investors, uh, the opportunities for investment, they are quite similar to those that I've mentioned for services. Uh, so they protect a uh, minimum standard of treatment for how investors than their home investors. There is also protection for investment and uh, there are rules on expropriation and compensation. Investors can also benefit from a facilitated business entry that I've mentioned before. Um, and of course, there are some exceptions as, uh, as usual. Uh, so moving to uh, another pillar, to the government procurement. The government procurement, well, the government buys things and uh, including goods, services, and also construction. And actually governments uh, buy quite a lot of things. And just one of the examples, the uh, European Union procurement uh, market is estimated to be worth $3.3 trillion uh, a year. You can bid on contracts to supply goods and services there. So a typical part, uh, pattern is that FTA often provide greater access to, uh, to FTA's partners' procurement. However, there are two things to keep in mind, coverage. 
so the free trade agreements, they specify uh, by which departments, agencies, and levels of government um, is covered. Uh, so which uh, departments, agencies, and uh, levels of government that run procurement that are covered by the FTAs uh, and over uh, in order to be captured in a specific trade agreements because we want to ensure that our national free trade agreements. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, our thresholds and coverage here in Canada. Uh, so moving to uh, to the next slide, and probably I'll just uh, mention briefly that uh, despite be being uh, a challenge uh, now, the COVID-19 offers certain opportunities. We know that uh, um, you, you might have noticed that many countries uh, such as the US, uh, China, India, and the European Union, even before, and um, COVID crisis is making even them even more so. And now also over 100 countries have uh, put in place temporary uh, import and export restrictions, including um, several uh, restrictions on agri-food products. Um, these restrictions are expected to be trade compliant uh, and uh, lowered over time. Uh, but they might uh, present a potential um, trade or competitiveness challenges due to subsidies. Uh, so entering in free trade agreements and removing barriers to trade domestically in, and internationally is more important than ever. And FTA contain, uh, contains rules uh, that apply even in, in emergencies. And the good news is that uh, Canada is committed to supporting Canadian and BC exporters uh, and the free flow of goods across its borders. Um, and it's actually made a number of joint statements in this regard with uh, uh, WTO, with CPTPP partners and uh, with uh, G20 uh, countries. Now BC is also, uh, also works um, to begin restarting the economy through a gradual and phased approach. And uh, BC government implements a number of measures to provide tax relief and uh, funding for businesses and service providers, including the uh, economic stimulus when the pandemic is over. So of course, the existence of an FTA uh, should not be one factor to consider when you identify uh, an appropriate target market. And we are moving to the next slide. Um, when you identify an appropriate market for your uh, goods and services. For example, it's important to ensure that uh, there is a demand for your product um, or for your service in a target market that involves actually research and analysis of your market potential and uh, solid uh, market entry strategy. And uh, if you are not uh, yet in touch with expert advisors from the Expert uh, Navigator program, uh, I strongly encourage you to use um, their free support uh, and ongoing guidance that they provide to businesses uh, to grow outside of BC. Uh, and another useful support service is BC's trade and investment uh, representatives offices uh, that BC has in many countries, including in the US, Asia Pacific and, uh, and Europe. And their role is to assist uh, BC companies to export their goods and services uh, by providing the uh, local market knowledge and intelligence and also ident identifying your key contacts in the market. And uh, so the, uh, in the last slide, uh, I wanted to share with you some resources and uh, uh, the contact uh, details of our branch and the international here to support you. And uh, we can help answer any questions that you might have. Um, and we are also interested to hear about any barriers uh, that you encounter in uh, Canadian or international market. And uh, we will uh, seek to address them and we can also advocate uh, with the federal government uh, that uh, they uh, be addressed. And we can also put you in touch with the with people you need to get your goods and services to the market. So opportunities in free trade and uh, we hope that uh, you'll be there too. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jana. And apologies everybody for the technical difficulties. We will be sending out the presentation so you'll be able to see those slides that were missed. So moving on to questions, the first question is from Matthew. It's, can stocks bought under the BC Venture Capital Program be put into a personal TFSA? Yes, the simple answer is yes, they can. They can be transferred into a TFSA. There are also uh, other places that 
shares bought and for which a tax credit has been received can also be transferred so to an RSP or a spousal RSP as well so yes great thank you Matthew uh, the next question is also for Matthew uh, may a business be set up initially to take advantage of venture capital tax credits or is this for existing businesses only there is no requirement as to when the business has to be set up. It's, it's not an issue. It can be a, a, an old and established business or a business that was newly incorporated two days ago. Great, thank you. Uh, and next question, this one is for Ghana. So this person is really keen to understand what opportunities can be explored for import and export from Canada to India, which can benefit consumers and businesses in both countries. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so from what I can say about the current uh, trade agreements between um, Canada and uh, and India, uh, there were negotiations that began in uh, 2010 and the last round was held in uh, 2017. Um, India's rapidly expanding economy offers, of course, tremendous opportunities for Canadian companies in uh, several sectors such as um, transportation, infrastructure, life science and uh, clean energy technology. Um, and some more traditional sectors such as uh, infrastructure and natural resources. Uh, but uh, so far, the uh, discussions on um, on the negotiations, they uh, were like, still ongoing uh, as of 2017. Um, and uh, if you are interested in specific opportunities, and if you are a BC registered business uh, with your office in BC, I encourage you uh, either uh, to reach out to your expert navigator advisor uh, or to the trade readiness and services branch uh, if you're based in Victoria or Vancouver. Uh, and uh, they will help you out to find uh, more specific opportunities that, your, uh, that will suit your business model and uh, uh, that will be of benefit to both countries. Thank you, Ghana. Uh, next question is from Matthew. Is it possible to crowdsource investors to obtain the tax credit? Yes, we have had registrants who use uh, crowdfunding websites. Uh, we require on all registrants to be in compliance with the Securities Commission. So the onus is on the registrant to make sure that whatever they do as the method of raising investment is in compliance with the Securities Commission. Uh, but we have had crowdfunded uh, uh, registrants in the program, and yes, it can be used. Great. Thank you, Matthew. A uh, question for Ghana. Do you have a Life Sciences one pager? Oh, thank you for the question. Um, I will check. We actually uh, produce them quite regularly. If we do not have one at hand, uh, we will make sure that we produce one and we'll share it with you. Great. Thank you. Uh, let me just see if there are any more questions. All right, I believe we've gone through all the questions. We have a couple minutes remaining if anybody would like to type an additional question. If not, you know, feel free to reach out to us anytime. Like it doesn't have to be today. It can be a couple weeks from now, a couple months from now. You have our contact information and we're always around. So let's give it a couple minutes to see if any more questions come in. All right, um, I'm seeing no more questions, so I think we'll close off for today. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Ghana, for those presentations. Uh, you know, we really are happy that um, you're able to be here today, today today with us. We were happy that everybody was able to join and participate. And like I said, if you've got questions about any of the trade agreements, about, you know, the different programs that we've talked about, about other countries we haven't covered, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out. If we know the answer, we'll give it to you. If we don't, we will certainly try and find out. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.